Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to Honors World History. Today we're going to give a brief overview of the history of South Asia. And so if you know anything about South Asian history, uh, you know it's spectacularly complicated. Our sourcing for it isn't super great. And so I'm just going to admit right now that I'm not going to do a great job of this. There'll probably be anachronisms. I'll probably refer to things improperly. And the goal of this is just to give you a basic overview of how South Asian history developed with the understanding that there it's going to be a lot of messiness and a lot of gaps. So here's your basic objective for today. Let's dive in and do a brief overview of South Asia. South Asia is one of our civilizational hearths that we talk about. The Indus Valley civilization is one of the first earliest human civilizations, along with China, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Uh, we don't know much about this Indus Valley civilization. Uh, we know that they were relatively urban. We know that they built uh, fabulous cities like Mohenjo-Daro that had pretty complex irrigation and plumbing systems. And we know that they vanished for some reason that we don't understand. Uh, we don't have any way to read sources about them, so we don't really know what their life was like. Uh, we just know that they once had a great civilization along the Indus River. Uh, they you know, built advanced sort of, again, cities and a variety of different infrastructure pieces. And then for some reason, they declined and vanished. They were replaced by migrants coming in from sort of the Caucasus region, what's known as Vedic society. The, the Vedics are going to bring in new styles of architecture, uh, Sanskrit, a new language, and they're going to found a variety of different empires, bringing in new religious and cultural systems that are really going to define South Asia going forward. And they're really going to displace any of the sort of remnants of the Indus Valley civilization with this more dominant Vedic culture. The, the form that is eventually going to um, develop that is going to dominate Vedic culture is this idea of Hinduism. And let me just first say that like Hinduism is incredibly complicated. There's a, a spiritual theoretical version of Hinduism versus a practical version of Hinduism. And I don't have time to really get into all of this. And quite honestly, I don't really understand it all myself. And so I'm going to give you the briefest overview of, of Hinduism, how it works practically versus how it works theoretically. And then we'll look at how it affected their society. So the basic truth of Hinduism is that the world is not real. All of the stuff that you're perceiving is not actually happening. Uh, there's this whole divine that you don't actually understand and can't comprehend. And the goal of this is to understand that you are divine and to then ascend out of the circle of life and death and rebirth, the whole wheel of samsara, to reach enlightenment. Uh, Hindus believe in reincarnation, the idea that your spirit keeps getting reincarnated until you reach this moment of moksha and have this uh, enlightenment experience. And they believe that over the course of your life, you develop, you accumulate karma based on your good and bad deeds in according, with, in according to your dharma, which is determined in a whole bunch of different ways. And that will partially determine how you are reborn after your death. So that's the simplest version. It's not a very good explanation of Hinduism, but it's what we have for now. So we're just going to go with it. Indian society, or South Asian society under Hinduism is divided into a variety of different varnas or classes with the idea that uh, on the top are the Brahmins, the priests, the academics, things like that. Then you've got the Kshatriyas and you've got, then you've got below them, you've got the business people and then you've got the Sudras in the bottom, the servants, and then you've got the uh, untouchable, the people who are not traditionally part of the Varna system. Within each Varna, you also have Jatis, these class, these castes or classes within Hindu society. Uh, none of this, the whole caste system thing is not a very good sort of way to understand how Hinduism works, but it's the framework that's often been used. And so the, the basic idea is, again, you have these various classes that you're born into and these various jobs that you're born into. And so you do the job that your family has was done, has done. And if you do that job well, you accumulate karma and are potentially good karma and are potentially reborn to a higher varna, to a different jati. Yeah. And so in, pra in practice, of course, this is the social pyramid of Hinduism. And most uh, Hindus throughout a significant portion of South Asian history live, work, marry, socialize within their various varna and jati. So all of that uh, defines Hindu life. Uh, Hindu sacred texts reinforce this. 
Uh, we have a number of Hindu sacred texts that we're not going to spend a lot of time on, unfortunately, because again, uh, this class is mostly from 1500 and after. So just some stuff you should know. Uh, obviously, doing your job well is the most important thing. Behaving in accordance with your, with, with your dharma behaving in accordance in the way that someone of your Varna and Jati are supposed to behave is how you accumulate good karma. And so take a moment, read these texts, make sure you understand what's going on here, and then we'll move on. The Mauryan dynasty was the first dynasty to sort of unify South Asia in the aftermath of the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization. Chandragupta was the conqueror who used a combination of new military technologies, including chariots and war elephants, to start unifying significant amounts of South Asia. He was able to do this through bringing in new irrigation techniques to make the rice fields more fertile, specifically wet field irrigation. And so with more rice, he was able to you know, feed a larger army and therefore able to significantly increase and consolidate his territory. As he expanded, he divided up the territories into Janapadas. I'm pronouncing, I'm going to pronounce everything wrong. So my sincerest apologies, I'll do my best, but it's, it's, I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. These provinces uh, were organized and were defended by forts that he built to help uh, provide his army places to fall back to. And so this allowed him to extend military control over these areas, to divide them up into these various provinces, then to bring in his sort of agricultural improvements, to increase their productivity and incorporate them into the larger Maurya Empire. His government was mostly run by Shanakaya. Oh, again, pronouncing it wrong. He was the head of state, and he was of um, he was the head of state of Chandragupta's empire. He helped organize the army. He was a brilliant military tactician. He helped organize the rural areas in order to sort of increase agricultural production, and he created a series of governmental committees to organize and to carry out all of these various things. Obviously, taxation allowed them to bring in more money, allowed them to raise a larger army, things like that. He also had a pretty complex secret police and spy system to prevent Chandragupta from being assassinated. He, uh, you know, they would they would move where Chandragupta slept to make sure that he was protected from his enemies. And he built this relatively powerful bureaucracy in order to allow the empire to continue to last and move forward. So all of these committees helped uh, organize all of this stuff. He also uh, developed a relationship with the, and the heirs to Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great uh, was de not defeated, but stopped and did not conquer South Asia at about this time. And the Maryan Empire was able to develop a decent working relationship with the Seleucids. And so we have some Greek and Roman sources referring to Chandragupta and referring to uh, South Asia in general. And so we've got these committees, and this is going to allow central bureaucracy to spread and to consolidate control over the empire. We're also going to see a variety of different religious evolutions during this time period. Uh, the, system, the religion that is today known as Hinduism took developed over a very long time. It took a long time for these sort of belief systems to settle out and for the practices to settle in. We also have Jainism happening during this time, which uh, is an offshoot of Hinduism. And Buddhism, the teachings of the, teachings of the Buddha, of Siddhartha Gautama who is going to take the ideas of Hinduism and evolve them to some extent. And so both Jainism and both Jainism and Buddhism are noteworthy. Jainism is specifically noteworthy because it's an absolute pacifist religion where people famously uh, wear masks to avoid killing even insects. And so we're completely vegetarian and tried not to kill any living thing. Buddhism also has some elements of pacifism, but uh, there's also some militant aspects of Buddhism that uh, we're going to look at in future classes. Ashoka is the probably is the most famous ruler of the Mauryan dynasty. He's going to expand literacy through standardizing language and standardizing uh, sort of the way that written words are presented. He's also famous for creating a series of pillars sort of throughout the empire, telling both the history of his reign and mostly propagandizing how great he was. He is going to greatly expand trade along the Silk Road. And so India is going to be more completely brought into the world economy 
during the Mauryan dynasty, bringing in substantial wealth to India through, or what is today India, what is then South Asia, through trade with China, trade with the Middle East, trade with Europe, and South Asia is going to become spectacularly wealthy because of this. Ashoka is going to be a great warrior using a lot of this wealth in order to conquer his neighbors after an incredibly devastating war with the kingdom of Kalinga. Ashoka is going to have a religious epiphany. He's going to realize that killing people is not great, and he's going to convert to Buddhism and become a pacifist. And so he is going to completely change the uh, sort of foreign policy of the Mauryan Empire. They're going to become pacifist, and they're going to stop militarily expanding. Uh, Buddhism is a very complicated religion. Again, Siddhartha was a great prince in India, and the, the story is that there was a prophecy when he was born that if he saw four things, he was going to be a great ruler unless he saw four things, and then he was going to be a great teacher or religious leader. And the four things were an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a Brahmin, a teacher. And so Ashoka, uh, not Ashoka, sorry, uh, Siddhartha snuck out of the palace one day and saw those four things. Then he had this epiphany, reached enlightenment, and realized what are called the four noble truths. Basically, all life is suffering. The cause of suffering is wanting things. The way we stop suffering and the way we stop wanting things is to stop desiring them. And you can full, follow a proper path of action, the noble eightfold path, in order to rid yourself of desire. All of these things are the basic underpinnings of Buddhism, and Ashoka is going to convert to Buddhism, and Buddhism is going to spread across South Asia. This, uh, this religion then uh, is going to spread across Southeast Asia into China and into Japan. Uh, the teachings of Buddhism are different from Hinduism in that they allow everyone to potentially achieve enlightenment. It's not just the Brahmin class. In Hinduism, you have to be a Brahmin in order to achieve enlightenment, where Buddhism democratizes that process and allows everyone to achieve enlightenment. Uh, there's a number of different types of Buddhism that we don't have time to get into in here. And the Mauryan Empire declines partially because the rulers after Ashoka were not great. Partially because the military, you know, the economics of trying to maintain this huge bureaucracy was too much. Partially because rebellions against his rule drains the funding. And partially because the Brahmins don't like the spread of Buddhism and want to return to a, a religion and a social system in which they are on top of the social pyramid. And so this leads to the Hindu Gupta dynasty under Chandragupta I. The Gupta dynasty never really exerts control over as much of South Asia as the Mauryan dynasty does. And honestly, they're relatively short-lived. They helped standardize Sanskrit as a writing form. They helped return Hinduism to the, be the key religion of South Asia and honestly, mostly eliminated the religion of Buddhism, although there's still Jainism and Sikhism and a number of other Hindu offshoots. And the Gupta dynasty is, again, relatively short-lived because they're going to be overtaken by the Muslims. We talked in previous lectures about how Islam expanded across the world and specifically into sort of into this area of what is today Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Afghans are going to conquer a relatively large empire across the northern stretch of South Asia. And over time, Muslim rulers are going to take over larger chunks of South Asia. The Delhi Sultanate is the first of these sort of early Muslim empires. They're going to use the advanced technology of the Muslim world to defeat the Hindu armies. We're going to see the beginnings of Muslim style architecture in South Asia. Delhi is going to be the capital of this empire. And this is the first of a series of Muslim rulers in India. And so the vast majority of people in South Asia are going to still be, they're just going to still be Hindu. They're going to still be Jain. There's some Buddhists, although they're mostly been driven out. You're going to have some Sikhs. But the ruling class is going to be Muslim. And so this is going to set us up for eventually the Mughal Empire coming in, which is going to be the first time that almost all of South Asia was unified. And so that's the story that we're going to tell tomorrow. Again, apologies for a combination of mispronunciations, anachronisms, and just a, not enough detail about South Asian history. It's fascinating. I wish we had more time for it. I wish I had more knowledge of it, but this is where we are. So thank you for listening.